Yeah. So that's not bad. Okay. Right, so, so I'm Oscar. I'm also a farm sign youth, and right now, I'm just also working at like farm stand and just going to college. Hi, Oscar. Okay, Oscar, pass it on to someone else. I'll pass it to Anthony. Hey, hey, everybody. Uh, sorry, I had my audio off. What what am I being passed? Oh, you're introducing yourself, telling us what you do at Grow NYC and um, anything you might be interested in uh, specific to this topic or, ag or any ag topic. Okay, cool. Uh, my name is Anthony Guevara. I'm a site lead for Cypress Hills and Brownsville in Brooklyn. Um, I'm interested in urban ag. I've worked for a couple of different farms. So yeah, excited to hear what we're gonna talk about. Great, and I'll pass on for you to Nabiha. Are you here? Hi. Um, there's a bit of background noise where I am, so I'll keep it quick, but I'm Nabiha, I'm a green market manager. And um, I just love seeing where our food comes from. And I've really enjoyed learning more about all sides of uh, the business and farming with green market. So I would love to mo learn more in detail. Rad. Awesome, and I'll pass on for you, Jacqueline. Hi, my name is Jacqueline. I'm a site lead at the Lower East Side Farm Stand and also PS57. And I'm currently in grad school studying the right to food. So I'm always interested to learn more about um, the local food system. And I'm not sure who hasn't gone yet. Um, oh, sorry, I muted. I... Nelson, hi. I don't know if you can unmute, but if you can, please introduce yourself and tell us and tell us what you do at Grow NYC and what you're interested in. Okay, we'll come back to you, Nelson. Isabel. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Isabel, and I'm a farm stand manager. Um, one thing I've been thinking a lot about is just what it means to live in a city. And, you know, we're very reliant on um, our food coming from elsewhere um, in our region. So I'm interested in just learning more of how that works and how we can um, better integrate, you know, food into our city and be more resilient in the face of crisis, I guess. And I also am not sure who hasn't gone. No worries. Sydney, I don't know if Thanks. you can unmute and introduce yourself. Or maybe not. Damali, are you able to unmute? Um, yeah, so can you hear me? Yes. Um, my name is Damali. Um, I am an undergrad. I go to John Jay College. Um, my major is political science, um, and I have a minor in Africana studies. Um, I have always been interested in um, like farming, but didn't really know like the details or like the specifics of anything. Um, so this job was like a really good opportunity for me to learn like the ins and outs. Um, and uh, even before this job, like I had never really thought about food justice. So um, definitely interested in continuing to learn more about that and my eyes being open um, to more of the food justice problems and food sovereignty and how we can work to solve it. Amazing. Thanks for sharing. And I'm going to uh, voice out some of the things in the chat. Uh, uh, Sydney can't unmute, but that's Sydney is uh, Sydney is interested in many things, but um, some that she's more interested in are food justice, social perspective, the food system, and she's a farm stand manager. And Nelson is um, 
part of the farm stand staff at Cypress Hills. He's interested in learning more about the variety of fruits and vegetables and was surprised and confused when he first started. All the greens look so familiar, it's insane. At least they did when I didn't have prior knowledge about any produce, uh, but he's also pursuing an undergraduate degree in physics. And I think Maddie hasn't gone. Maddie, are you able to unmute and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Maddie. I'm a farm stand lead um, at, it used to be Morrisania, but Tyra took over Morrisania, so now I'm just Gouverneur in Crown Heights. Um, I'm interested in, similar to what a lot of people have said, like food access and um, agricultural systems and making sure just everyone has, you know, access and Awesome, I think that's everyone. Uh, Tehuti, you just joined. I don't know if you're able to unmute, but we were all just introducing ourselves and saying who you are and um, what our connection to Grow NYC is and anything and what we're interested in, in, in as it relates to ag. Are you able to unmute and say hi or do you wanna put it in the chat? Okay, I'm gonna assume you're gonna put it in the chat. Oh. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining Tehuti. <laughs> so we have a good mix of um, of staff and also youth staff. So um, a lot of, uh, we've been talking a lot about different uh, topics related to food and agriculture. Last week, we were talking about food sovereignty. So today we're talking, we want to hear from somebody who's actually working on a farm, who owns a farm, um, what goes what goes into like thinking about starting a farm, what goes into the actual work behind the scenes. Um, Kelly, if you don't mind introducing yourself again for the folks who just joined and, you know, just sure. taking it away. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, my name is Kelly. I own Corton Farm. Yeah, it's a farm I started in 2017 and I sell in Green Market. We sell on um, Saturdays and Mondays in Union Square. And uh, I also am involved in FCAC, which is Green Market's Farmer Community Advisory Committee. So it's um, a way for producers and community members to get involved in what the direction of Green Market is as far as um, not specifically sites, but just where the market's headed and um, farms that are there, products that are there, and uh, the kind of influence that we want to have in the communities that we serve. And Tutu asked me here tonight, and so I it was really nice to hear all of your introductions and just have an idea of, you know, where each of you are coming from, from a perspective. And there's definitely a lot of like through lines of my life um, in trying to figure out and then eventually deciding to start a farm. Tutu, you want me just to start like with my background in farming? Yeah, yeah, actually, no, just start, start from like, how you even got to the place of like, why, why, why you wanted to own a farm, what you did before. Mm -hmm. um, some of our, our youth staff are in high school, some of them are in college, and are starting to think about like, how do you set plans to like, get to where you are, essentially. Yeah, I, I guess I would say I kind of started late. I'm from Northern California originally. So my parents always like to make the joke, like, why couldn't you start a farm there where they live? Um, and instead, I moved to the East Coast. I went to Yukon for a year, which is actually the State Agricultural School of Connecticut. Um, and there's like 40,000 acres maybe on that campus. It's a lot of dairy. It's a lot of ag research. And I went to be a biology student because I wanted to be a forensic scientist. <laughs> I was really into that aspect of science. That's and I cool. got there. Yeah. <laughs> I got there and the classes were super huge. And I was just like, this isn't really the, the direction I want to go. Um, and I transferred and I went to Lang, which is the at the new school. So I was on 11th and 12th Street. And I actually shopped in Union Square a lot. And I would shop in Grand Army Plaza on the weekends. And I loved going to the farmer's market. I'd also grown up going to farmer's markets and had like a lot of um, agriculture around me growing up. But I was just never part of it. And it really took until some friends moved up to a farm upstate. I'm in Sullivan County, which is Southern Catskills, about two hours Northwest of the city. And they moved up to a farm and I moved up and I, I had so many opportunities to start working in agriculture, you know, just throughout my life and it never really stuck. And this was one of tangibly being on a farm that made me interested in it. And, uh, 
it took a while for me to think this is actually what I wanted to do. When I went to school, I went for education studies um, and I wanted to be a high school math teacher. So I've always been more inclined with numbers than letters. Um, not the best like reader writer, but really good at math and science. And I thought about being a high school math teacher that that seemed pretty fundamental to if I could get kids to engage in math and understand it, that, that it was a lot of problem solving skills that are useful in everyday life. And I thought it was like pretty foundational to how you could your structure, you know, um, your impact with students. And then I found farming and I thought, dang, this is actually more fundamental of how do we get food to people? How do we grow food and how do we understand it um, like within our own livelihoods? My family generationally, I've been removed from farming for, you know, probably three generations. Uh, at some point, my my family came over from like England and I would imagine that they were farmers, but no one in my direct family has farmed outside of having like a, a prize winning garden. And so the idea of starting a farm after working on farms for a really long time was really new to me and took a lot of understanding from a lot of different aspects that it's a business, that you're growing food, that you're managing people, that you're making decisions about where you're going to sell, what you're going to grow. Um, so there was a lot of factors in that that didn't make sense to me until I had worked on a farm, worked on several farms before I started um, and actually decided to, to start my own farm. I worked in uh, New York, Massachusetts, Arizona, and Pennsylvania um, to really try to figure out what it was that that I wanted to do in within the agricultural system. Because there's obviously, there's a lot of policy work that you can do that's super important. Um, there's a lot of like in-city market work and work in Grow NYC. It's, you know, the organizational aspects of selling food. And I just kept coming back to the, the idea of being outside and growing that was the part that made the most sense to me and that I was the most drawn to. And I have some friends who I've worked with on different farms and they've moved off of farms directly and, and gone more towards the policy side of things. And, you know, it kind of takes like all, all hands on deck to like move the large ship of agriculture, or I guess I should say like the large tractor of agriculture. So I really appreciate where each of you are coming from as far as like the, the interest that you have in the avenue into agriculture, because it, you know, there's no, uh, there's no overage of people who, who care about our food system right now. So I think anybody's impact is helpful. Um, but I really wanted to start a farm. I really liked watching things grow. I think someone was talking about how, like when you first walk to a market and you look at all the things that are growing. For me, the, the understanding of how each thing was growing, like how a strawberry comes out and is a flower first and how a bean forms over time and even trees budding, like the whole process, I grew up pretty rurally, but I never was connected to it in a way that I am now that is, it's my livelihood. And so I paid a lot more attention. Um, but it was, it's like an entire process of getting to understand farming and vegetables that came first. And then for me, the secondary aspect was the business side of, if you want to start a farm, you're also starting a business and, and what does that look like? So to, to feel free to yeah. put any, any specific questions or something. Sure. I'm not covering. So um, how did you get from, okay, I'm interested. I worked on farms to, I'm going to start a business. Um, I I mean, I don't know, but did you get into it for money? What do you think? For sure. <laughs> um, how did you, I guess, just paint a picture for us. How did you get from a mindset of like, I'm okay working on farms to, okay, I do want to run my own business and um, have all these different responsibilities. I guess like being in agriculture in a way that was different from just um, being part of the far of farm staff. Yeah, I had far, I had managed one farm for, five years. And so I had enough experience in that one circumstance. It was a, a vegetable and berry farm that I understood the operation of that production specifically. And, and I thought, okay, there's enough here that, that you kind of get to that point, maybe with anything in life where you understand enough, what you would want to do if you had the choice. And it came to the point where it was harder to stay doing it someone else's way 
than it was to start doing it my way. And starting a farm is a huge undertaking. But if you if there's anything in life that you're passionate enough about and you have enough ideas about that it keeps kind of gnawing at you that that's that's where you want to pursue. I think that's like the impetus to pursue it that first you have like the passion and the enthusiasm to do it because there's like plenty of hard work, plenty of decisions, plenty of bad, you know, errors that you could make. But if you have the the passion behind it, I think it makes it a lot easier to to make the leap. So I had been working on this farm and I just had a lot of ideas of things that I would want to implement and ways that I would want to do it. And um, so I really thought, okay, if you're, if I'm serious about this, I wanted to decide where I wanted to farm. And I was pretty certain I wanted to farm in the Northeast, but I also um, think the crop that I care the most about is beans and the Southwest through all the tribes that are down there has the, the richest history of bean heritage in the country. And so I really wanted to go down and understand what Southwestern farming looked like. And if that was something that I was interested in, um, in understanding more of the indigenous ways of the Southwest and, and the cultural history of agriculture, especially in Arizona. So I worked on a farm down there and it was like a pretty immediate understanding that I had that I loved the heritage of the Southwest and loved the history of indigenous tribes and the way that they have tended the land, but I didn't love the market setup. And in starting a market farm, you had to think about where you're gonna sell and who you're gonna sell to. And I worked at a farm that was outside of Phoenix. So it's like one of the bigger cities in Arizona. And having come from sold in Union Square and sold in the city, it was like a, a pretty big change. You know, there's just not the volume of people. There's not the interest in like the scope of foods. And um, and it was a pretty fast decision that I was like, no, this is not where I need to start a farm. Um, so I made a lot of friends working on farm down there and I'd go back in the winter to visit them because that's the, the nice thing to get out of New York. But I moved back to, to a pretty similar place where I had managed um, the farm before and uh where my I started looking for land within a two hour radius of the city that was kind of my my um my circumference that I wanted to work off of because it's a it's a drive but it's not too long um and that was the the real like changeover to think okay if, you, if I knew that I wanted to start a farm in New York and I am not sure I would have started a farm had I not gone to Arizona and understood that um that New York is where I wanted to sell. And I think maybe that's the most important thing about starting a business is that you're understanding as much as you can, right? There's a ton of decisions that you'll make later that you don't fully know when you start it. But if you have the idea of the through line of, this is the crop I'm interested in, this is the market I'm interested in selling it, this is the people that I wanna engage with, then you have like a full understanding of how you wanna start a farm and the the main like points that you need to hit along the way. And then you fill it in the rest of the way with experience, right? Like I didn't know everything that I know now when I started the farm, I obviously thought I knew enough <laughs> to get going. Um, but there's every year, there's a, a huge learning curve and a ton of experience. And, you know, this year was a hard year to learn the lesson of irrigation for, for instance, but um if you have an overview, I think, of what you're interested in and then how that comes to fruition, because as much as it's growing food, it's also like a business of employing people and paying bills and buying supplies. And so you do have to think of that from like a financial economic standpoint, what's going to make sense. And um, and that's like the, the other half that's not as exciting at all. You know, it's not as exciting to manage people or to think about finances, but it's yeah. part of the business of having any kind of agricultural production. I see Damali's hand is raised. I'm going to let her ask a question, then I'll volley you another one. Damali? Um, did you find it hard um, buying land in New York, like the prices? I know that plots of land, even upstate New York, are very expensive. Yeah, so five years and Kelly, I still rent. Can land. I actually add to oh, that sure. too? Um, you know, in New York, how when you go to rent an apartment, you have your application, you have a deposit. Can you also tell us, like, what did you need 
did you find it hard to find land? Was it expensive? But what did you need also to like actually buy the land? I so yeah. To, so the first part of it is I don't own any land. Okay. And that's like a terrifying aspect of the fact that my livelihood depends on the soil that I grow in and the longevity of that soil. So like things that you like are not the exciting things to think about is like the cultivation of like weed management, the amount of fertilizer that you're putting in the soil, a deer fence that you put up to protect from deer, all of those things you can take the fence with you, but the maintenance of soil, you don't get to take with you when you leave. And that's the, like the bummer about renting land. And that's, but that's the option that I have because I don't have the kind of money to buy acreage. And I also don't have the access to buy like the land that I live on currently, that's kind of in the background there was our first farm. So uh, when we started the farm, this is where it was. And just last year in, well, we signed, yeah, we signed the lease in 2021. Um, we rented 20 acres, maybe like um, 15 miles South of us and moved the farm there because it was a longer term lease and it was a better setup for the farm in the long run whereas this land the landlord wanted to sell and I wasn't in a position to buy it and so I really wanted to set the farm up to have success in the future and so the lease that we have on the new land is a five-year rolling lease which means that it's always it's renewed annually for another five years and so that kind of security gave me enough confidence to put in infrastructure that we don't have here. We never put in infrastructure here for the first five years. There's no barn here. There's like no um, infrastructure other than a fence we put up. And you can kind of see in the corner there, that's, um, that's our wash pack station. There's like a propane tank, but like that's the bulk of infrastructure that we have here because I didn't own it and I didn't want to put a lot of time into something that we couldn't move or that would you know, not be cost effective to move. So our new lease setup is much more secure and I have what's called first right of refusal. So when that family, if they ever decide to sell it, we have the first option. However, that doesn't guarantee that they're going to sell it at what would be a fair market rate for agriculture. And I think what Damali was saying of, of like, especially during the pandemic, folks who had the ability moved up and bought land and that land doesn't necessarily stay in production. And that's maybe one of the like biggest calling cards of my generation of farmers, of younger farmers who don't already have access to land is access to land, affordable land, good land, good farming land um, within a distance of, you know, any kind of market. And I mean that like a lowercase m, like the economy of a market that you can get to, whether that's New York City or that's another city in the state or, elsewhere, wherever you go, rural economies can only support so much before you need to, you know, like have access into supermarkets and like larger structures. And so the ability to sell in a market like a green market where you have like a public um, frontage and you can engage individually is super beneficial to like the Hudson Valley, Catskills, the radius that green market um, has producers in. But it is that same challenge that when you're that close to a city, lots of people want to buy land and second homes. And they're, for me, in my personal opinion, they're in direct contradiction between somebody wanting access to land to keep it in production and somebody wanting land to, um, you know, have what's like kind of colloquially called a gentleman's farm of just haying it or, or mildly keeping it into any rotation. So yeah, to, to, it's like not a fun story to, to answer your question of just being like, I don't own land. Um, the the, the you, reason I moved in the, mm -hmm. the like headache of moving, which was more than I ever imagined, was that I think it's a much more secure setup for the farm in the long run. And there's some neighbors that um, are also willing to rent their land. And so we have like a room to expand to. But it's not, uh, it's definitely not like a surefire way. And I have friends who have, met, you know, met landlords in a variety of ways. And most, most folks I know, my age who farm, do not own their land. And again, it's like a scary aspect of you put in any kind of infrastructure 
and it's either a burden to take off or you, or you can't move it at all. And I think that that's like the long-term thinking of that you really have to figure out if it, if it is going to work out because they're, it's not like they're heavy consequence, but it's just like a, it weighs heavy on the rest of the farm operationally of how much you can produce with the infrastructure you have or don't have, which I've, you know, I have plenty of, if anyone wants to know some things not to do, I'll be happy to say. <laughs> do you have, is there any help available for folks who are, who are renting versus like owning? Um... Yeah, so the, the way that I started to find land, there's things that are called land link websites, land, L-A-N-D, L-I-N-K, land link. Um, and I found this first property through that and I just bothered the landlord until he responded and he did and he was like if you want it, it had been fallow for a really long time so like it wasn't really it was very weedy essentially is what happened when we moved here um, but there's one called Hudson Valley Land Link that one's pretty active and so it's landlords who want to have their land farmed and also tenants or farmers who want to farm and it's a it's a pretty good service to like connect people because otherwise, how do you know? And I had been wanting to move for a couple years, just trying to to get that in motion because I knew that our, our tenure here was pretty short term. And I just happened to drive down a road I hadn't driven down before and um, and found this piece of land and had done what I had done maybe like four other times, which is to look up the tax parcel and look up who owned it and send that person a letter in the mail, like a cold call and just say, hey, I see you have this piece of land. I'm a vegetable farmer in the area. I'm really interested in renting it. Like, would you ever consider it? And up until that point, no one ever wrote me back. <laughs> so I was just like, all right, like it'll figure itself out when it needs to. And this landlord called me back and said, hey, actually this, you know, we're, I think we're really interested in this. And and we went through a number of steps to before we actually signed the lease because they had just it had just been in corn forever. And vegetable farming is very different than corn farming. It's a lot more involved. There's a lot more infrastructure again. And um, so we just want to make sure that it was squared away. But I can't remember that I used um, there's a resource to help you write a lease, which I used online. I'll try to get that to you too, too, because I um, found that helpful. And the other resource, I think, I'm not sure how much you guys talk about it, but the National Young Farmers Coalition is something that I'm a member of and it's has a lot of helpful resources and also does like a lot of good advocacy for farmers who are my age and younger as, and who don't, I think some do come generation, generationally from farming, but a lot don't. And so it's, it's um, uh, you know, access to land, access to, markets, access to water, access to other farming networks, student debt relief, like there's a, you know, access to climate mitigation, there's a lot of things that it advocates for. And I think that's a pretty good um, place for resources too, because it is kind of like, um, like it is a thing of where do I start? You know, I need the land, but I also need equipment and I need to get into market and I need a crew and I need to I need capital and there's like a lot to undertake. And that's again, why I kind of say like, it is a business at the end. And I'm very happy that what I started is an agricultural business, but there's a lot of not fun. Like, I think I was happiest when I was just in a greenhouse all day and seeding things. And that's, that's an activity I don't really get to do anymore. <laughs> it's like not part of my daily ro rotation or schedule. Um, if, if, if the folks on this call were interested in, you know, in, in kind of doing what you're doing, and let's say for a vegetable farm, right? Because when you bring in animals, it like makes it even more yeah. complicated. I'll say so, we don't have animals because I don't want to care for them every day in the winter time. That's like yes. my fundamental reason. <laughs> I don't want to go outside in the snow and take care of anything. Valid. <laughs> um, how much would someone, okay, and let me know if this is a, I don't think it's sensitive, but I think it's just like helpful. How much would somebody need, you know, to to save, to have squared away for the first couple of years um, as they're thinking about starting a farm. Just so I think it's up. like what you have saved, what you have access to, what you can okay. go into debt with and what you can get loaned. Okay. And I don't, I would say it depends on the size of the farm mm -hmm. and I don't want to deter people from this. Mm -hmm. 
and it depends on how much infrastructure you want to put up. But like a hundred thousand dollars, and yeah. that, and like I think a lot of people will be like, well, I don't have that. You know, why I can't? <laughs> I, don't don't come away from this phone call and say I don't have a hundred thousand dollars, so I can't start a farm. <laughs> that's just me thinking like if you didn't have anything and that's not to say that I had a hundred thousand dollars, but I'm just saying like, if you cut and paste started a farm, uh, maybe that's what you would need now, especially as I buy things. Now things are way more expensive than when I bought them. Um, I had some savings from just working like on a, as a farm manager and saving from that. I had some money that family members lent me. And then I also took out credit cards from, for the business. And you can get some equipment finance, which was super, super helpful. Like a lot of agricultural companies understand that you are a new business and that you can't outright buy things. Um, and then- uh, Quick question about, yeah. I know this is a little bit in the weeds, but if you're starting a business, is the credit history, the business's credit history or your personal credit history? Depends on how you structure the business. I'm a single member LLC, so it's just me. Okay. okay. So even more in the new in the weeds. When I when I file taxes, I just file one tax for the business, but it's also me because technically the farm's income is my income and my income is the farm's income. Okay. Okay. But that's like so like credit wise, some farm. So like I tried to buy this is an example. I tried to buy a Kubota tractor because the dealership was close and I like Kubota tractors. And I couldn't get financing with them because the business hadn't been around long enough. And this was like, you know, a month after I formed the business. John Deere on the other side was like, yeah, sure, no problem. And I double checked. I was like, how can you, it's immediate, like no problem. And they really were like, yeah, no problem. So it's just a matter of like how you can get funding. I think also rurally, like a lot, there's a smaller banks that understand agriculture and are willing to set up programs with you it's kind of what we're looking at now if we have the possibility to buy some land is to go through a bank um, and have them finance it because they understand like our area specifically, it's only like a in-county bank instead of a large corporate bank that wouldn't really be interested in renting agriculturally or um, lending agriculturally, I guess. But so that $100,000 number is just me thinking like if you had to buy everything, if you had to I guess it's like what I wish I had. <laughs> it's like, I wish I had infrastructure. I wish we had more equipment when we started. I wish we had fencing when we started, uh, like a vehicle to get to market. That's what I like wish, right? But instead you piecemeal it together and you like do the most necessary thing um, next. And so five years in, we still don't have the infrastructure that we I wish we had we have much more equipment which is like helpful because as grateful as I am for my labor force I want them to stay happy and so a lot of the equipment we've purchased like just makes jobs easier and that's worth the investment to me above some other things that like maybe I would rather have as a farmer that you know we don't have so but I guess it um Again, it really depends on your size. If you don't want to have a tractor, if you don't want to have equipment like that, it's a lot less. If you wanted to have an acre or two that you think you could manage with the number of other people in your operation and you want to do it with much less equipment, I think that um, there's a lot of small farms out there that do that. And I think the benefit of that is like, it's like human scale agriculture is how it's sometimes termed that you don't have to buy equipment and invest in that. I went the equipment direction because I wanted to be a larger scale farm. And again, because I know how difficult it is to work on a farm and do, you know, the what's called stoop labor, where you're always stooped over of harvesting. And I wanted to try to make that as easy as possible on myself and, and my crew of, you know, whoever that would be. Because at the time when I started the farm, there wasn't there wasn't a crew. Like I just hoped that I would be able to find people who wanted to work on the farm, which thankfully has worked out in the past few years, but it's uh, another variable to consider. So yeah, I guess I should correct myself that I wished I had a hundred thousand dollars to start. Uh, I had, I'll be frank and say I had tw like around 20,000 saved up myself. And then I had um, like a $40,000 loan from, from family members. And 
I don't actually know how much credit card debt I went into, but that's like the, the eventual amount before we started making money back. And Anthony is asking how many acres is your farm? So the field that we have now is 20 acres. Wow. Which to me is great. <laughs> the field here, um, we had like a three acre field and a four acre field. And that wasn't all in production because it was kind of um, the tree line was really close to it. So it's really shady. Um, so I think we had about six acres in production here. And to have a 20 acre field that is very wide and flat and open and doesn't have anything in the middle of it was like a huge game changer this year. This was our first, 2022 was our first active growing season. So it was a big scale up and a lot of things worked and a lot of things didn't, but the general direction is positive. So it's been really nice to have that kind of acreage. And then I think I mentioned that we have neighbors who are also willing to rent to us. And so there's, there's two more roughly 20 acre parcels that we can grow into, which is again, encouraging of why I would put in more infrastructure over there because it, uh, it has potential. Whereas the, the fields that we were here were very limited in size. Um, what are, I guess you've shared a little bit about the challenges you face. Are there any other like really big challenges you faced as you were starting out and um, were beginning to farm? I mean, definitely like access to capital. Like if I hadn't had family members who could lend me money, it would have been a lot, I would have been a lot more stressed on my own finances of what I could, you know, the savings that I had and then the debt that I would go into. And I would maybe say, look more into, I also had got some, there's pretty good, there's some random and good grant programs out there that you can get. And I have benefited from that in some, they're like specific, it's like for high tunnels or for different equipment. Um, and uh, those are good resources, but I would probably look more into like loans from banks instead of going into debt if I didn't have capital from family members too. Because I think that still was like a really binding time for the farm when it started of, of not having, um, infrastructure to get everything going. So I think, think about your scale and think about what you want to accomplish as far as how big that is. And I had worked on a farm and so I like knew that acreage and, and thought about that as like the founding basis of how to scale up. But otherwise, as far as like internal farm, deer are a huge burden, like no matter how big your farm is, if you want to have a front yard, I would still fence it in. Um, that's like the most pressing thing that I can think of right now that's like other than weather, which you, is not really a variable that you can control. Deer you can control. And then finances, you can do just do whatever you can in order to, to make it work. I mean, don't, I shouldn't say that. Don't go into debt that you don't think you can get out of, but it's, it was a lot harder than I thought. And I thought I was very lucky to have the resources that I did have. And it just took a lot more, took a longer time. And it took um, like a lot more than I originally thought. I think like business plans, if you, I don't know how much you guys talk about business plans, but you can make a business plan and have the best intentions and it is still always harder than always harder and always more expensive than you think it's going to be. Um, thanks for saying that. That's important to remember. <laughs> That's like the honest, like <laughs> sad part of it. Yeah. Um, you did talk about business plans. Uh, we're not going to talk about business plans, but more about like what values went into how you're running your business, um, what you know, labor practices you have, what your growing practices are, um, or are there any values that you use to design? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm making an assumption, but I, I, I guess knowing you, I, I know some of your um, just values, but I guess for the folks here, what are some things that you are thinking about that helped you determine what kind of business you'd run, how you'd be interacting with your staff, what labor practices you'd have, and what growing methods as well you were using on your farm? 
Okay, I'll do labor first. So I had been a farm manager and I um, I thought that I was like a decent crew lead and I thought that I was like pretty good at communicating. And then I went to Arizona and I was just on a crew again. And so I wasn't the manager and I was just part of a, a team. And I, 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 I won't say hated, but I really didn't get along with my boss. And it was the kind of um, work where you always felt anxious that someone was gonna tell you you're doing something wrong. And like, why are you doing it this way? So I think that was like the most immediate experience I had before I started my farm. And it really made me think a lot about how you treat labor and how you treat your workers. And if the labor is cast to be a job that's not desirable or that they're insufficient at doing versus something that can be done as a team and as a unit and um, is skilled and valued. I think there's like a consideration that there's this idea of unskilled labor and that's definitely not agricultural labor. I've never encountered what is unskilled, but it's not um, picking, it's not harvesting, it's not um, anything that we do. So that was like the fundamental way that I approached having my crew is that I treated them with respect or that I treat them with respect and that I treated them the way that I had wished I'd been treated on that crew and, and, um, and had positive experiences at previous farms. It just happened to be this last farm that really maybe made it an impression that I took forward into, into having my farm. Um, and right now it's just me and two ladies. That's the whole crew on the, on the field. Um, and it's their second and third year returning. So I feel confident that I'm doing an okay job that they want to come back. And I think that that's like the sign that if you don't have a lot of turnover, you are, um, you know, you're creating an environment that people want to stay in. Uh, other than that, I think I spoke to, I try to make our job, there's a, there's a whole notion of work smarter, not harder. You can work plenty hard in a field all day. And so what can we do to make things easier, to make it more efficient, to make it more ergonomic? Um, and so that's been a lot of our equipment investments that, again, I might not have made those the, like the priority that they were, but I saw the value in it benefiting the crew first. Um, so those are like, that was a huge focus of just us working more as a cohesive unit and it being easier in general. Um, and then growing practice wise, um, one, of the, one of the reasons I started the farm um, was to grow beans. And specifically, I'm a vegetarian. And so I, when I started a farm, I decided that I didn't want to use any animal products on the farm either. So often um, manures and different parts of animals are used in fertilizer. So bone meal, blood meal, feather meal are pretty common. They're good sources of nitrogen, calcium. Um, but we made the decision not to use any of that. So I was thankfully found a fertilizer that's um, not based in manure and our, with the exception of our potting soil, which I haven't found a solution for, we don't use any um, animal byproducts. And that's not something that I necessarily advertise. It's just super personal to me. And so that's like the choice that I make. And uh, though it is funny when we advertise it, there's a lot of conversation about it, but it's just not like a, a main attraction of why I farm. And um, we are not certified organic, but we don't use anything synthetic. So that's synthetic fertilizer or uh, synthetic pesticides or insecticides. If we use something for mainly an insect, we don't really use any um, herbicides. Uh, it's something that is organic approved and it's what is like a concentrate of a bacteria or something that would be found in nature, just like at a, a more concentrated level. And um, to me, that's like the clarifying difference of the way that I want to farm. So it's nothing that's petroleum based, whether that's the fertilizer or like a spray application. And that means that we're using fertilizer that's mined. So um, like elements and minerals that are in the earth, which is not the end all be all great solution. We're trying to get away from a lot of fertilizer use and incorporating more cover crops onto the field. Um, but as far as the fertilizer that we do use, nothing is synthetic. And again, with the, the same thing with like any chemical compounds for insecticides, nothing is synthetic. 
meaning that it wasn't manufactured and it that what we do use is found in nature uh, at like a lower dose rate. Uh, I guess that's kind of it for growing practices, unless there's like a more specific. No, yeah, okay. that was really good. Um, <laughs> uh, are there any questions for, for Kelly from you guys? Go ahead, Liz. <laughs> Hi, Kelly. Thank you for being here today Hi, and yeah. doing this. It's great. I feel like I've talked to you a million times and I've barely ever heard your beginning farming story. So it's right, right. here. Um, you've mentioned before that you are recently, you recently started doing Nourish New York. Will you talk about that a little bit? Like what it entails and what it means for your business? Yeah. So um, we started, I started the farm to go to market specifically, but during the pandemic, it kind of made me realize that we don't sell to anywhere upstate and I wanted to be more involved in the community that I'm pulling from, right? That I'm pulling my labor resources from and that I'm pulling the land resources from. Um, and I had originally not sold up here because I didn't want to sell the restaurants. I, it's not like the focus of the farm. It's kind of a, an afterthought. So there was a, there's a program called Nourish New York and our county extensions, which I'm sure do you guys talk about county extensions at all. Oh, okay, this is a, a segue that I think is important. So every county in every state, so each state has a land grant university. New York's land grant university is Cornell. In every county, that university has an extension. So I use the Sullivan County uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension, they're called. But um, in, every state has one. I think in Massachusetts, it's UMass, and they probably have one in your county. Um, and I do think that there's a Cornell in Brooklyn. Yes, there is. That's where it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they're super good resources. And in the pandemic, what happened in Sullivan County is they shifted a lot from agricultural programming to um, like food access in the area because it's, um, it's not a very uh, economically thriving county. It um, is like a it's an old dairy county that doesn't have a lot of dairies anymore. So they really started to shift their resources to giving people access to the food in the area. So Nourish New York is a program that allows farmers to sell locally, allows folks locally to buy from farmers at a price that makes sense for both parties. So it's a, a benefit to me, it's a beneficial subsidy, right? Like a lot of governmental subsidies that go into agriculture go to corn and soy. And this is a state run program that helps smaller farmers and specifically vegetables, probably covers dairy too, um, and allows it to stay closer in the community and to not do it at the consequence of either party of the farmer getting a dollar that they need and the organization being able to buy the food that is the like healthiest best option for what the community that they're serving. So we started selling um, through our extension and our extension was running a food pantry and they were able to do that through the program that's nourished New York. And I think, I don't know what it looks like for 2023, but it's honestly been one of the programs uh, like the government state programs that I've participated in that's been the most functional and helpful for seemingly everybody. So it's nice to see that as an option instead of like a, like a bulk commodity, um, subsidy. I once went, I once went to our, like our big local office for USDA and got all the papers on like crop insurance and everything. And I was like, oh, this is so outside the realm of like anything I understand. So we're 20 acres, which I'm excited about the size, but I'm like a pittance into, you know, any kind of like large, what you call like big ag, because I just don't, I don't like not on that scale. Maybe so one you, day. You but. don't even do whole farm revenue protection or insurance, no. <laughs> on your bean, insurance on your beans or anything like that. No, okay. we have like zero crop insurance. It's like, so it's funny. Like, um, I'm like a rounding error to farms, I think, you know? So yeah, we don't, we don't have any kind of, I have like a farm insurance. We have what's called a special farm package. Um, and it's through an insurance company that's called farm family. And that's a real thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't have any, any kind of crop coverage and we never have just because it's like, it's so small. It's not small to me, right? It's my entire life. Right. <laughs> <SDA is small. laughs> I know. Um, 
any any other questions, folks? I will say I could put my email in the, yeah. in the chat. And if anybody ever wants to ask questions, you can always come by market, but also okay. I'm happy to chat to and chat. like help Great. you think through something. If if what you want to do is start a farm, that's like the side of things I know how to do. I don't know how mm -hmm. to do like a lot of the other things. But I have um, two last questions for you, yeah. Kelly. One's pretty quick. Do you save seeds? Yes. And it can get you into a lot of trouble. <laughs> Because then I just start saving all the varieties and making like, look, this is on, this is at my kitchen table. I've saved these bean seeds because I was shelling a bean the other day. Uh -huh. It was a, it's a pinto bean, but um, it's darker. Can you see it? It's darker in its pigmentation nice. with light speckles I see, instead yeah. of light with dark. And so mm -hmm. I like have bean seed everywhere in my house and trying to to like save different varieties. Mm -hmm. And then we also saved this pepper that I thought was gonna be a sweet pepper and it turns out it's a hot pepper. So you should be really supposed to. Oh, <laughs> to but it's also cause I grew, too, I grew them too close together. But yeah, I'm actually really into growing open pollinated varieties. Um, we also don't grow anything with a patent on it unless mm -hmm. that patent is directly um, benefiting the like very small breeder. I, we try not to like we grow anything that's a patent from a, a larger seed company. Okay. Uh, seed books can talk about that but cool i'm going to let angela angela has her hand raised hey i don't have a question but i just do have a comment first as liz said it's really great to see you kelly and to hear your farming story i uh, really appreciate that um and just to let all the the youth know as well um kelly i don't know if this we came in a little bit late but kelly is also um part of our farmer and community advisory committee that we have for green market um, so she's part of helping to advise Green Market on how we uh, fulfill our mission um, and how we create rules that uh, govern how they uh, how we you know have the markets throughout the, the city. So we really it's really great wonder, working with Kelly um, on this uh, important work that we do and really sort of collaborating with our farmers um, on, on the uh, future of Green Market. Thanks, Thanks yeah. Angela. Um, Kelly, what is what are some things you wish somebody said to you before you got into farming? Things that you know that, now that I wish someone had said that to me before I got into this it would have saved me a lot of sleepless nights. I I think it's like you if you it took me maybe the exact right amount of time, but when I started, I felt like it took me forever. If this is what if there's like a, a desire that won't go away to start a farm, and that's what you keep thinking about every day then do that. If it's not that, then I would say figure out what it is because for me, it was that, and I'm really glad I did. And I'm grateful that it's, you know, worked out and I've been able to figure it out along the way. But I feel like there's like so much advice that someone can give you that like, they don't know who you are and they don't really know your situation or like what you're interested in. And I, I, <laughs> More than anything, people give really bad advice when they don't know you. I just wanted to be hesitant about that. But if it is something that you're really invested in, then um, you know there's that whole saying of like find something you love and you'll net and you'll never work a day in your life. And then there's the counterbalance of that is like find something you love and you'll always be working a little bit because I'm never not thinking about the farm, even though we don't have animals and I don't have to take care of them on a February day. Uh, it's always like in the back of my mind what what we're doing, what we're expanding, what I need to check on, what I need to start as a project. So my only thought would be to advise, if you wanna do it, do it and figure it out and get whatever resources you need based on community and market and, and you know finances. And also be ready for it to be like all encompassing. It's not really a, a I guess for some people it could be a part-time job, but right, if you wanted to work um, outside the farm and work on the farm, for me it wasn't. I just made the plunge and and uh, and worked on it full time. But it's it's definitely a lot. It's even a lot in year five. So that's the only consideration. It's like a it's a long game. You got to play the long game. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Kelly, for your time and for going into just the deeper context of what it takes to think through and run a farm. Um, I am going to share uh, all of the links that Kelly mentioned, but also resources. Thank you for your email. Um, resource, there's a book uh, that I think is Letters to Young Farmers that I think is a really good collection of letters from hey, the very- I should read that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a collection of, of just- um, Let essays and letters from people who are either in food policy or who are farmers and talk about um, just giving advice to people going into farming. Um, and also just uh, the same resources that you've talked about. And I do want to also mention that Grow My Sea has a farmer assistance program that has a new a beginning farmer uh, course that they run every year. Um, and if you're interested in, in you know, in getting into that course, let us know. We can put you in touch with the folks who run it. There's also a farm school in New York City that runs um, a, a bunch of different urban farming classes as well. So there are a couple of resources that I'll put in the Google Classroom so that you can all have them available. But Kelly is also a really great resource who's always in the green market on Mondays and Fridays. Saturdays. And Saturdays, Mondays and Saturdays. So if also if you're a bean lover, Kelly's a person you yeah, if you ever want to talk beans, I <laughs> love talking about beans. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for joining us, uh, for participating. We hope uh, you found this conversation as enlightening as I did. Kelly, thank you so much for your time. We'll see you out there. Um, good night, everyone. You're dismissed. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Good night. Hey, thank you, Kelly.